This city dates back 2,800 years. It's renowned for having the best preserved city wall in China and for its more than 3,000 courtyards. A hundred years ago, it was China's financial center. It boasts the oldest painted clay statues of Buddha and it is still home to more than 40,000 people. It has become the common heritage of the human race. In the middle of China's Shanxi province, there's an old city called Pingyao. This small city aroused some attention in the 1990s. The story of the city began, however, 2,800 years ago. General Yin Jifu of the Zhou dynasty built the city to guard against invasion and harassment by the nomadic peoples of the north. To commemorate him, a temple was built 600 years ago by the eastern wall of the city. Less than 300 meters to the east of the city lies his tomb, and it's said his clothes are buried in it. Yin Jifu is regarded as the founder of Pingyao. The ancient city wall is both the origin and the symbol of Pingyao. 2,800 years ago, the Zhou dynasty ruler stationed troops at present-day Pingyao and had houses built there. Earth defense works were also set up, and this is the origin of the city wall. In the year 1368, China entered the era of the Ming dynasty. The Great Wall in the north was rebuilt and fortified. At the same time, the government had walls built around important cities. The huge bricks needed for this were mass-produced. In 1370, a brick wall replaced the former earthen wall surrounding Pingyao. This construction work lasted a dozen years. The present-day city wall measures about 12 meters in height with a perimeter of 6.163 meters. The wall's foundation is around 10 meters in width and 3 to 6 meters at the top. The length of the waterway can be seen when the 3 meter deep moat runs dry. Outside each city gate is a square called a barbican, the same height as that of the city wall. In peacetime, it served as a checkpoint. In wartime, a number of enemies could be led into the enceinte a kind of special enclosing wall and destroyed quickly by a cascade of fire from above after the gate was shut. On February the 13th, 1938, the city wall performed its military service for the last time. Japanese aggressors bombed its eastern corner and then they swarmed in and occupied the city. In modern warfare, the 600-year-old fortification was of no help. Shell holes made by the Japanese troops at the eastern corner of the city wall can still be seen. From the year 1368 to 1911, the city wall was renovated 26 times. Since the 1980s, central and local governments have allocated 10 million yuan for its restoration. The square-shaped city covers an area of 2.25 square kilometers. A street runs on the north-south axis of the city. An 18.5 meter tower stands at the central point of the city. The city's traffic net consists of four streets that cross the city, eight evenly allocated avenues, and 72 crisscrossing lanes. 
The different colours of the roofs tell the classes of the residents. Yellow and green roofs belonged to government offices and temples, and the grey ones to the commoners. In the early 1980s, sweeping economic reform took place in China. Unfortunately, because people did not know the value of old buildings or simply because they stood in the way of cities undergoing expansion, many heritage sites were pulled down over a short period. Ping Yao was caught up in the whirlwind of this reform. It too had a comprehensive plan for reconstruction. According to this plan, New broad streets should have been built, eight great openings should have been created through the city wall, and many skyscrapers should have been erected. This destructive plan was put in motion in 1981. However, due to a lack of construction funds, the project carried on slowly. At this moment, some Chinese experts on ancient buildings heard the news and they urgently appealed to the government to stop the demolition. The proposal was at last adopted, and the ancient city of Pingyao survived a crisis thanks to their undeveloped local economy. Of 4,000 cities in China, Pingyao is the only one that still has its original layout intact. Pingyao's civil residence area follows the quadrangle design, a Han ethnic style from northern China. In the compound, low brick walls divide courtyards. The eight meter walls surrounding the compounds resist sandstorms from the north. To get more sunshine, most compounds are built facing south. One unique feature of the Pingyao civil residences is that the principal houses take the form of the cave homes found in northwest China. The difference is that the caves are not built by digging into slopes, but are constructed with bricks on flattened ground. The principal house usually consists of three to five caves. The exterior is reinforced with a wooden corridor and tiled eaves to shield the house from rain and sunshine, and the eaves are decorated with various engraved and painted motifs. Wealthy families would have a story built on top of the principal house. This upper story would be a brick and wood structure serving as a salon or study. With various walls and garrets built on their tops, the principal houses were higher than the neighboring houses, and that was meant to ensure the house owner's favorable position in terms of feng shui. Among these residences, the oldest is that of the Ji family built in the Yuan Dynasty. Its courtyard is large and simple in design. Most civil residences in Pingyao, however, were built during the period from the mid-17th to the 19th centuries. From the 18th century, industry and commerce in Pingyao developed very quickly, and the local people became richer. Large residences for rich businessmen and landlords emerged. In recent years, many civil houses have become run down due to lack of repairs. With the population living in them having multiplied, they're in a dilapidated condition. In Pingyao, the gates to the courtyards are in various styles. Some are arched and others have a tall and narrow porch. The most eye-catching is the ornamental hanging flower gate.
Ornaments within the house are symbols of different times. This is the only well-preserved brick engraving niche in the city. A brick sculpture of a Roman clock is seen on the gateway. Ping Yao has more than 400 well-preserved courtyards built between the 14th and 19th centuries. On the southeast of the city wall stands the Kuei Star Pavilion. Kuei Star is the first star in the Big Dipper. According to Chinese Taoism, this star governs literature and writing. There are 3,000 battlements on the city wall and 72 watchtowers that were used as observation posts and arsenals. The numbers 3,000 and 72 symbolize the 3,000 disciples and the 72 most outstanding students of Confucius during his preaching in many kingdoms. Opposite the pavilion is the Confucian temple built in the year 1163 and rebuilt during the Song and Jin periods. It is the oldest of its kind in China. Inside the Confucian temple is Ping Yao Middle School, the best school in the region. The number of students admitted into universities on a yearly basis demonstrates this fact. On the gable at the back of the main hall is inscribed the huge Chinese character Kuei, meaning number one. It's said that a big drum was once hung here and that only a native who became the top scholar in the highest imperial examination was entitled to beat it. Ping Yao never brought forth a top scholar in the national imperial civil examination, but nevertheless, a local play tells stories about scholars who worked hard and had success. Third Madame Educating Her Son, a Shanxi opera, tells of a naughty child who loses his father at an early age studies hard under the strict discipline of this third madame, his father's second concubine, and an old butler, and finally comes first in the imperial civil examination. Shanxi opera is a popular form of local opera in the middle of Shanxi province, but nowadays it's hard to trace the origins of Shanxi opera. These odd-shaped cold steel items are military weapons from ancient and modern China. In the last 1,000 years, People who possessed martial arts skills provided armed escort services for valuables in transit, thereby acquiring a handsome income. This civilian organization was called the Armed Escort Service. In the early 19th century, even if businessmen made a payment to the service, there was no guarantee that their assets would safely reach their destination. A dye house firm in Pingyao had branches in provinces all over northern China, so some Pingyao businessmen deposited cash in its branches. With a certificate, they could withdraw cash from its main firm in Pingyao. Clients had to pay a premium for this service. Lei Lu Tai, the general manager of the dye house firm, realized that this was a great commercial opportunity. After years of preparation, Lei created a new monetary management system whereby a special bank draft could be used instead of real cash. With this service, people wouldn't need to carry a large amount of money. In 1823, Lei Lu Tai spoke to his boss Li Da Chuan and officially proposed that the Dai House firm be changed into a private bank named Rishang Chang. Li Dajuan invested 300,000 taels of silver in the project, the savings of his family for generations. Li Dajuan and Lei Lu Tai agreed that bank management power and a certain percentage of the initial public offerings would belong to Lei. The bank's main customers were large firms. They could easily shift funds and make payments via bank drafts, 
thus removing the need for traditional cash settlements. The draft would only have one receipt held by the customer. The bank adopted the principle that a draft is accepted no matter who presents it. The draft bore a set of specially designed passwords understood only by key members of the bank staff. Chinese characters were used as ciphers. The bank also had a rule that drafts should only be cashed at least three days after being submitted, which gave the draft holder some time to make a declaration if it was lost. Appointed persons whose handwriting was familiar only to insiders wrote each draft. In addition, the ciphers were frequently changed. Even today, no one can decipher them. The bank charged the client a percentage fee for transferring the money according to the distance the remittance covered. Transport was underdeveloped at that time, so the remittance period was very long. During that period of time, banks lent money at a low interest rate to businesses, and it was in this way that the banks earned extra income. It's difficult to find the exact sum of the profits that the bank made, but we know that the 300,000 taels of silver invested by Li Dachuan earned a dividend of 15 million taels of silver over the next 100 years. Daily business reports from the head office and its branches were submitted to the finance section and the chief accountant supervised all the accounts. An accountant and an assistant looked after various accounts. The bank also had a complete reporting system, the core figure of which was a scholar. This scholar was selected from the most successful candidates of the imperial examination, which offered them high status and salary. Every day, branches of the bank sent business report letters to the head office. It may have received more than 100 letters a day, dozens of which had to be replied to immediately. The general manager was in full charge of the bank with help from two assistants. The chief accountant reported the everyday balance. The scholar collected information from all the branches and submitted this to the general manager who would then make instructions to the branches which would be forwarded on by the scholar. In its heyday, Ruishang Chang employed 15 people in the head office and had 35 branches throughout China. In total, the bank had around 150 employees and the employees were recruited according to very strict requirements. There had to be boys between the ages of 13 to 15 years old who passed tests on the use of an abacus and who could write using regular script. Their families had to be free from any criminal record for three generations. For three years of apprenticeship, the bank would offer them only room and board but no wages. After the apprenticeship, the bank would give the wages directly to each boy's parents. The bank adopted a lifelong employment system. As the apprentices learned their business better, they would work in the branches for some time, and in due time, they would get specially appointed shares. Rue Shang Chang had nine managers, and each of them started his career as an apprentice. During the Qing Dynasty, government officials often needed to transfer a large amount of silver, and these officials became the most loyal private clients of the banks. As the banks flourished, relief funds issued by the government, local taxes and even war reparations were remitted with drafts issued by local governments. In the capital city, the clients could withdraw cash from the bank's branches and deliver it to the national treasury.
In the middle of the 19th century, Chinese private banks entered their heyday. More than 40 private banks were in operation, most of which came from Shanxi province, and more than half of which were from Pingyao. Pingyao thus became the financial center of China. It controlled almost half of China's currency circulation. In the history of these private banks, fraud by forged bank draft never occurred. Because of its strict management, later generations had no chance at all to get hold of a used, genuine draft. The only complete surviving draft is a hundred years old. Probably due to clerical error, it became invalid, and so fortunately, it's been preserved for us to see. These are the correspondences of Er Sheng Chan. This particular accounts book kept partial accounts of Er Sheng Chan in 1840. It is the earliest accounts book of the bank found thus far. From the late 19th century to the early 20th century, China was shaken by social unrest and private banks suffered huge losses repeatedly. In the 1920s, private banks in Pingyao entered their twilight hour. From 1823, when the first private bank, Rishang Chang, was founded, to the closing of the last private bank, Bao Fanglong, private banks in Pingyao had lasted a full century. To the southwest of Pingyao stands Shuanglin Temple. It covers an area of 11,000 square meters. Painted clay statues can be found in every hall of the temple. The highest statue is three meters in height and the shortest just 10 centimeters. Of the 2,050 statues that remain, 1,566 are perfectly preserved. These painted clay statues were created from the 10th to the 19th centuries. They are considered honored treasures. The first building in the temple is the Hall of Heavenly Kings. Under the eaves, the four gigantic statues measure above three meters in height. They're usually known as the Four Heavenly Kings. The eyes of the four heavenly kings made of embedded glazed balls look very lifelike. This is a unique sculptural technique in China. In the first courtyard is the Hall of Sakyamuni. The founder of Buddhism, Sakyamuni, sits on a high seat in the center. On both sides, stand the Bodhisattvas, Manjushri, and Samantabhadra. The walls are lined with painted clay statues. They tell the legendary story of the founder of Buddhism from his birth to Nirvana. More than 200 vivid figures are placed ingeniously between the buildings and rocks. Also in the first courtyard stands the Hall of Arhats, in which 18 Arhats are enshrined. Arhat means someone respected by mortals. These Buddhist statues, ranging from highly stylized to realistic representations, reveal the ancient artist's imagination and creativity. They're regarded as masterpieces. The Hall of Mahavira in the next courtyard is the tallest in Xuanglin Temple. Because the Buddha subdues various devils, in Sanskrit he is known as Mahavira, or Great Hero. The three huge Buddhas are the three incarnations of Sakyamuni. To the east of the Hall of Mahavira is the Hall of a Thousand Buddhas. The pose of the main statue of Avalokitesvara is leisurely with a tranquil countenance. It is 
a rare masterpiece of its kind. Next to it is the statue of Skanda, protector of Buddha's teachings. It is praised as the first Skanda in China. This statue with a vivid face and glistening eyes measures 1.6 meters in height and manifests the beauty of a powerful warrior. It is the most outstanding painted statue in the temple. Along the wall are 500 painted clay figures displaying the rich Buddhist pantheon of deities. Opposite the Hall of a Thousand Buddhas is the Hall of Avalokitesvara, enshrined with an Avalokitesvara with a thousand arms and a thousand eyes. Avalokitesvara is the most merciful deity for those in distress. She's more like a graceful lady who has a thousand arms and a thousand eyes to save the common people. Twelve kilometers to the northeast of Pingyao is a prominent temple called Jinguo Temple. Jinguo Temple was first built in the year 963. It was rebuilt through ensuing dynasties. The complex faces south, consists of two courtyards and covers an area of 13,000 square meters. The Hall of 10,000 Buddhas, built a thousand years ago, preserves the architectural style of the Tang Dynasty. Its salient feature is the almost square hall covered with a huge roof and uplifted eaves. It looks magnificent. It's one of the earliest wooden buildings found in China. In the Hall of 10,000 Buddhas are 11 clay statues representing Buddha and his disciples. These statues are the only 10th century painted clay works remaining in Chinese temples. They are considered national treasures. The Three Buddha Pavilion in the second courtyard was first built during the Ming Dynasty. Within are 37 painted clay statues and 52 wall paintings, all in a well-preserved state. The clay statues of the Buddha and four bodhisattvas in elegant shapes and natural poses are 14th century masterpieces. Executed with simple brushwork, the series of paintings with motifs of plants, landscapes, and human figures on both gables depict the extraordinary life of the Buddha. This Chinese scholar tree is more than a thousand years old. It's kept company with generations of monks. Although it's less than three meters high, this bizarre tree is one of the attractive features of the temple. Pingyao in the north of China is situated in a traditional farming region governed by a temperate continental climate with cold dry winters and hot rainy summers. The main crops are wheat, sorghum and corn grown on over 53,000 hectares of farmland. Towards the end of the 20th century, the area was producing sufficient grain for the local people. In this ancient city, more than half of the population still call themselves farmers, but they've lost their farmland. Many run small businesses and are more like independent businessmen than farmers. Life goes on and sounds of various kinds echo in the streets of this ancient city. Life in Pingyao is expressed with a vivid and fresh reality.